Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. Sorry for the, the delay. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties um, on the speaker's end. Um, this presentation will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, uh, you can use your chat bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, there are two handouts that Cindy graciously provided to us and we will be putting them in the chat box as well. If you need to contact us or you want to interact with us, here are a few of our ways you can get a hold of us. The Ontario Ancestors website, our Essex County branch website. You can watch previously recorded uh, presentations on our YouTube channel. We have a very active Facebook group that you can join and you can share and ask questions. And we have a Twitter account that keeps us up to date on all the news and events going on in the branch. We wanted to remind everybody about our big, big event that's coming up in June. June 5th and the 6th is the Ontario Ancestors Virtual Conference 2021. Registration is now open. In the week leading up to the conference, however, we, we do a lead up. So Monday, May the 31st, Mark Olson will join us to talk about what is new at the Family Tree Maker. Then on Tuesday, June the 1st, Christine Woodcock will discuss genealogical research institutes. Then Wednesday, June the 2nd, Mike Mansfield will talk about the vast and virtual genealogical library at My Heritage. These presentations are an hour long. They start at seven o'clock each evening and they are part of your conference registration. Then on Friday, for the first time ever, Ontario Ancestors and Ancestry have partnered and they will be bringing a full day workshop that you can participate in as well. This is separate from the conference. It's an additional $25, but it is well worth that amount of money to be able to chat with the Ancestry people, learn new tips and tricks. And as I said, it's a full day workshop. That's on the Friday, June the 4th. And then conference begins the Saturday and Sunday, two full days, two streaming uh, sessions, 22 sessions, sorry. And there's lots of information. All these sessions will be recorded and attendees at the conference will have 30 days to go back and watch anything of interest or anything that you missed. So be sure to register now at the conference website. We usually take a break over the summer, but we will be meeting back in September, September 14th at seven o'clock. It'll be 50 years with heirs. We will be welcoming the Harrow Early Immigrant Research Society, known to all of us as heirs, who have been around for 50 years now. They celebrate 50 years this year. They have been, been preserving local history and assisting people researching their ancestors in the Harrow and surrounding area. Members of AIRS will be joining us to talk about the material and the resources they have in their impressive collection. Tonight's presentation, Finding Our Female Ancestors by Cindy Moynihan Foreman. Cindy's interest in family history began in 1980s. Her original focus was on her Irish and Scottish ancestors who settled in Southwest Ontario in the early 1800s. She's created My Monaghan Genealogical Blog, where she honors her ancestors, shares genealogical findings, provides tips and useful links for other family historians and genealogists. Cindy enjoys creating interesting content for her blog and filling in the dashes between the birth, marriages and deaths. She loves breaking down brick walls, like locating women ancestors who appeared in a record and then seemingly disappeared without a trace. So Cindy, now that yes. you're back with us, thank goodness, we're glad to have you. And I'm I very glad. My, I will stop my screen share now. Um, so I wanna start off first of, all, first of all, just by thanking the uh, Essex Branch volunteers who are absolutely extraordinary. And I wanna thank 
the Essex branch volunteers past and present because I have been a benefactor of the great work that goes on in this very, very busy branch. Um, certainly since the 80s, since I've been searching for my ancestors, the branch has always been incredibly helpful for me. And I also want to thank them for the invitation to speak tonight about finding our female ancestors. It's a subject that's really near and dear to my heart. And especially in the month of May, which is actually the month that we have traditionally set aside since the 1900s to honor motherhood, maternal bonds, and the influence of mothers in society. And this opening slide that you see here is all of the matriarchs in my life, a lot of them from Essex County, um, but starting with my mother in the top left-hand corner, all the way down to my third great-grandmother on the bottom left. So, um, so I'm very, very pleased to have an opportunity tonight to talk about uh, finding our female ancestors and not just the mothers, but also the grandmothers, the daughters, the sisters, the aunts, the nieces, the married and the unmarried. And I hope through this presentation, people will be inspired if they're stuck finding a certain female ancestor. And I hope that you get some insight on some interesting places that you could look. So first of all, I wanna talk about how finding our female ancestors is incredibly challenging, particularly if we're looking for female ancestors prior to the 20th century. And of course, there's a lot of reasons for this. First of all, the records of the day were, as we all know, created by, for, and about men. So for example, property was usually listed under the man's name. Men ran most of the businesses and controlled government. And history books were also written by men and usually featured the prominent men's of the time, men of the time uh, with very little information about the women. The other reason why it's challenging is because women's names change. Uh, not only do they have many, many nicknames, but a woman uh, has her maiden name, possibly a married name. And even when she has a married name, she may be uh, represented in certain documents under her husband's name. The other uh, reason why finding our female ancestors is so challenging is because of the laws and social ideas that limited women's roles and rights. Women were seen as the weaker sex and a woman's place was in the home. And this was very much a part of the so social norms until fairly recent times, as well as laws that prevented women from holding land or holding political office and voting and much more. We'll look at that more closely in the next slide. But also there was the, the issue of the invisibility of women's work and their contributions in society. And women were seldom, seldom ever written about. And I found this lovely passage that was written by Nicholas Flood Davin in 1872, where he talks about a Kavanaugh family from Kilkenny who had settled in Essex County. And of the Kavanaugh family, Nicholas wrote, the father, the sons and the daughters set to work clearing up the land and tilling it from year to year. While they were thus employed, the mother, a brave little woman, 45 years of age, supplied them with provisions which for two long years she carried on her back from Sandwich, a distance of 13 miles, frequently bringing a hundred weight of flour, while at every step was almost knee deep in mud and water. I wanna hear more stories and read more stories about the women like Mrs. Kavanaugh. And I hope the reason why you're watching this webinar tonight is because you do too. Uh, what I wanted to talk about was I wanted folks to maybe think about an ancestor, a grandmother who might've been born around the beginning of the 20th century and how certain rights that we take for granted today were not afforded to her. And I wanted to talk about just four of those. So in terms of property rights, it wasn't until 1884 that the Married Property Act was passed in Ontario, which allowed women to legally enter into legal agreements and buy property. 
And in terms of voting rights, in 1867, when Canada's new constitution, the British North American Act, it actually made a, a point of excluding women from voting. However, after a half century of activism by suffragists, that would change. And in 1916, so think about your ancestor and how old she might have been. In 1916, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta let women vote provincially. And then in 1917, Ontario followed, becoming the fifth province. In 1918, all Caucasian women could vote in federal elections, but this still excluded any of any other folks, including the Aboriginal people of Ontario. And it was not until 1960 that all Canadians could vote, including Aboriginal men and women. In terms of holding political office, um, the Essex County biographical indexes carry many stories about the men of business and industry and those who held political offices. And even though women were able to vote in 1917, it would not be until 1919 that a bill was passed giving Ontario women the right to hold political office at the provincial and municipal levels. And in Windsor, you know that your first woman mayor was elected in 1983. And the last point that I love to talk to people about when I'm talking about the social norms of the day is that women, uh, would you be surprised to learn that your female ancestors were not even considered legal persons until 1929? That same British North American Act of 1867 referred to persons, which the Supreme Court of Canada ruled in 1928 did not include women. In fact, it wasn't until a group of prominent women activists known as the Famous Five took it to the Privy Council that the decision was reversed and women, in fact, did become persons under the law. I think about my two grandmothers who were in their late teens and early 20s during these, when, uh, the time period when these four rights were granted to them. Well, I'm trying to click now. Sorry. If you look. Yeah, see there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so let's find her story. So tonight I'm going to talk about a couple ways that you can do that. It's no surprise that given the history, the laws and the social norms of the day, that we often struggle to find the records and stories of our female ancestors. But the good news is it's still possible. Tonight we're going to look at five strategies for five common genealogical records. And then I'm gonna tell you about five case studies of unique scenarios in my own family tree. And some, hopefully it will inspire you to look at certain record collections that you might not have thought of. And then finally, I'm gonna end with some Essex County records and resources that are just a gold mine of information for our female ancestors. So, through the many years of collecting my ancestor stories, I have lost a lot of female ancestors. They were lost, but they certainly were, were not forgotten. For example, this image in front of you on the screen now was in an envelope that was passed to me from my grandmother, Rhea Coughlin, and it was marked simply great-grandmother. The fact is that we all have four great-grandmothers. And when I received this envelope, I had no idea what the maiden names were of Rhea's four great-grandmothers. Now, 30 years later, I still know only three of them. Here are some more examples of lost women in my family tree, and perhaps similar to women ancestors in your tree. Named in a will, my fourth great-grandfather, Matthew Moynihan, named his daughter Mary in the will in front of you, in 1857. He left her bed clothes and one bed. Matthew died in 1860 and I have never ever located Mary to this day. She wasn't on the 1851 census, she wasn't on the 1861 census. It wasn't until 2019 in fact that I learned the names of all nine of Matthew's children, his six sons and daughters. And the son here, named in the will Timothy, eventually inherited the property in Maidstone. 
The other thing is sometimes you'll have a scenario where you'll be looking through a set of censuses and a name all of a sudden will appear in the record. And then 10 years later, the name is gone again. So this is another big challenge, especially for women ancestors, if you have no idea where they went. And we'll talk about a couple cases like that. In this uh, particular case here, you may find the names of women in an obituary, like this obituary for my second great grandfather, Jeremiah Moynihan, who died in 1922. It listed the names of his two sons and his six daughters. This would have been really difficult for me if I had to rely on the obituary, because as you notice, the family, the daughters are named Mrs. Alex Chobin, Mrs. Edward Lennon, Mrs. Alex Russett, Mrs. Joseph Lozon, and Mrs. Frank Flannery. This was one of the social norms of the day, that when women were named in the newspaper, they often were named under their husband's names. And I have several instances of young women who were orphaned at a very young age. Their mother died when they were quite young, and then they were sent to live with members of the extended family to care. I had this happen in both the DeMars and Broderick families in my family tree. This picture here is a picture of Daisy, and she lived with her mother and father until 1911. Both of her parents died in the years between 1911 and the next census in 1921, and Sarah was lost to me. Even though I had her funeral card that indicated that she lived until 1945. Where did Sarah go for those 35 years? I'll talk more about Sarah later. Also, some women in the family tree may join a religious order making it very challenging to find them. I had a cousin whose name was Madeline DeMars, and when she joined the religious order, she became Sister St. Paul of the Cross. It would be very hard to locate her in the records if I hadn't known that. And then the other case is, uh, sometimes you will notice that members of your family, the female ancestors, are either ill or of unsound mind. I had, uh, one ancestor who on the census was marked this way, and she was very difficult to find, and we'll talk about that more later. Okay, so when searching for your lost female ancestors, the top place, the very first stop, has to be these five common records. And why is that? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, these records are the easiest to access. You can find these records on Ancestry, uh, which is a paying site, but you can also find them for free at Family Search and Library and Archives Canada, and of course at the Archives of Ontario and at the Essex branch of the Ontario Genealogical Society. The other reason why this is your first stop is because these records are the most likely to provide detailed information on your female ancestor. When we talk about common records, we are talking about marriage, birth, and death records, which can reveal all kinds of information, uh, especially maiden names for women. In Ontario, pre-Confederation uh, birth, marriage, and death records are generally found in church records, like this example that I'm providing right here, which is an 1833 marriage record for my third great grandparents who lived on the Middle Road in Essex County, but they were married at St. Anne's in Detroit. This record, as you can see, yielded a trifecta of information for me because it gave me not only the maiden name of my second great, third great grandparents, but it also gave me the maiden names for two of my fourth great grandmothers. So this was a record. And in addition to that, it also provides all kinds of information about where they came from in Ireland. Keep in mind that the 1869 Vital Statistics Act of Ontario was largely ignored until the 1880s, but this is the best place to start your search. This is a um, 
cemetery plot record for Mount Elliott in Detroit, where my third great grandfather, Dennis Moynihan, is, was buried in 1885. And these records and family plots can yield all kinds of information about relatives that you may not even know of yet, as is the case for me, where you see Ellen Doty, Mildred Lewis listed in the bottom. And here we have an obituary and obituaries are like an incredible source of information on female ancestors. And in this case, it's Margaret O'Falvey who lived on the farm directly beside my great grandparents. And her obituary states that she arrived in Essex County in 1825. This obituary was such a gold mine of information that it helped me eventually determine that her maiden name was Sullivan, which actually helped me to discover that her first husband's name was Costigan. She was also a cousin to the famous Essex County Judge John O'Connor. One small obituary like this of two paragraphs can yield so much information in helping us find our female ancestors. And lastly, biographical indexes. They are often records of affluent men of the day. However, they also often mention the sons and daughters in a family and their locations where they live. This particular excerpt is from the portrait of Denver and vicinity Colorado. However, in this one paragraph, you can see that it's possible to trace a Colorado senator named James Moynihan from his grandfather in Maidstone, Ontario, whose will we saw earlier. Even though these biographical indexes are primarily about men, they should not be overlooked for their information about the women as well. Okay, before you begin searching the five common records, it's helpful to dedicate one sheet of paper to your female ancestors and build a plan using the following five strategies. In the handouts, I've offered a page, a 13 page handout on links that you can search, but I also have a three page handout where you can use to sort of identify exactly what you want to know or what you do not know about your female ancestor. So the first strategy for identifying your female ancestors in common genealogical records is making sure that you can identify her. And by that, I mean to know her name, not only her name, but all of her nicknames. Uh, so in this example, you can see these are four women who appear frequently in my family tree, Bridget, Catherine, Ellen, and Honora. But then you can see that they also go under a whole lot of other names. So it's always a good idea to be very clear about your ancestors' nicknames, their maiden names, their married names, and always be aware that uh, when you're looking at records, that sometimes when people are giving the names, they are often spelled phonetically, and that the indexes and records reflect the handwriting of the recorder. The other thing is to be mindful of some of the naming practices uh, that exist. And in the handout, I've given you links to look at some of the particular naming practices that you have to be mindful for. And the last point in identifying is to be aware of how to use wildcards in your searches um, as a way of navigating through lots of records in particular databases ex like Ancestry where there's thousands and thousands of records. And so there is a way to narrow it down. And I've also added a link to Randy Major's Ancestor Search, which helps you look for your ancestors on Google. The second strategy for searching common genealogical records is to be sure that you're being strategic about your search. Just entering a name into a search engine it's going to be very frustrating and it won't be enough. So to avoid this, the frustration, I suggest you develop a plan that is clear about what it is that you want to know about your female ancestor. So to ask yourself, what is it I want to know? Where would the information be? What exact time period would it have happened in? And why do I need to know that information? 
and also to be clear about record collections. So sometimes by being very strategic and going through a particular record collection can be really helpful for finding your female ancestors. The third strategy for searching common genealogical records is to just really look at all the information you already have and, and really go through it with a fine tooth comb. Look for things like who were the informants, who were the sponsors, who were, who were, um, who were, and try to always use the original record as opposed to the index. And in addition to that, build a timeline and note, are there any gaps where I'm not sure where the ancestor was? The next, the next strategy for uh, searching your common genealogical records is to really refocus. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit, is to sort of be aware of your female ancestors fan club. So what is her fan club? It's her family, associates and neighbors. So sometimes when you can't find the information specifically and directly about your female ancestor, you have to look at the women's children as well or even look at the death certificate um, of the husband, etc. Widows are often also found on some of the census records with their married ch children. Young couples may be found living with their wife's parents. An elderly parent may have been added to a household. So by reviewing her fan club, you may in fact accidentally stumble upon where your ancestor went if you've lost her or there's a gap in your timeline. And then the last strategy for searching common genealogical records is to make sure that you think about the location. Often, particularly in Essex County, any gaps in the Ontario common records, you may actually have to look over in Detroit, Michigan as well and elsewhere. So now we're gonna talk about some uncommon records really quickly. So you've looked for your lost female ancestor in the five common record sources that we just talked about, and you've used the five strategies and you still have some gaps and some unanswered questions. It's now time to explore some of the uncommon records that may contain additional information about your female ancestor. One of them, is oral histories. Oral histories in November 1987, I had the privilege of sitting with my father and a distant cousin, Bernard Broderick, to reminisce about our family history in Windsor. Bernard's family is doubly related to mine in that we both descend from the same two Broderick and Monaghan lineages. Bernard's mother died when he was only two years old and he described what happened to his sister Mary in the oral excerpt that I have written on the side there. That's a picture of Bernard with his mother, Clara, who passed away. And he said, then my baby sister, she must have only been five. Old Aunt Nellie took her in and kept her from the time she was five until she was 20. Mary was a clever girl. She had finished high school and had just started nursing and so forth. And she just fell in love with this guy, a wonderful man. So there, just in that brief oral interview, a whole lot of biographical information appears about Mary Broderick, which is just lovely. And how would you know that otherwise if it weren't for the oral history record? Another place to look is land records. They often give the names of uh, spouses and children and heirs and relatives and neighbors. Also legal wills, and this was the case with Matthew's will that I showed you at the beginning. Legal wills were sometimes filed with the registry offices in Ontario when it involved the transfer of a parcel of land to an heir. As a result, these wills were never probated and only appear in the registry office files. I give you a little helper to help you figure out if you have any wills from your family tree in the land registry offices. Also military records. So here is the military record for my distant cousin, Leo Joseph Broderick. And as you can see in the papers, I went to the uh, Library and Archives Canada to get his military file. And as you can see on the right there, it asks all kinds of questions about his father, his mother, his brother, his sisters, are they alive, their health, 
Um, so this is also another great source of information for your female ancestors. Church records and histories are amazing. And in particular, uh, in Sandwich South, there is a lot of church records there for St. Mary's and other churches as well. And they have a lot of information. So for example, this page that you're seeing right now to the left was, came from St. Mary's uh, anniversary. It was their centennial anniversary booklet. Not only did I find references to many of my ancestors, but I found interesting snippets about other members of the community like this Annie Markham, who was the telephone switchboard operator there from 1923 to 1957. There's also city and county directories, which are invaluable because they often will mention whether a woman listed in them is a widow or not. There's also local and county histories that are available at local libraries and in the genealogical branches. Um, early in my research, I purchased as many books as I could get my hands on about Sandwich and Windsor and Essex County. And even if you can't find your ancestor, the great news is that these, these books often give you historical context to help you find, um, I'm just doing a time check here and I'm running kind of short, so I have to speed it up. Um, so the other thing is Bible records. So for example, this Bible record here um, helped to establish the birth date of my great grandmother, which she needed. And in 1949, her, her uh, brother provided a copy of the family Bible. And sometimes if you're lucky enough and your family had them, they have all kinds of information in them as well. And letters and diaries. So this is a letter that uh, I received in the 80s from my cousin Evelyn that provided all kinds of indirect evidence that collect connected a bunch of families together. The interesting thing was that the gentleman pictured below, he lived in downtown uh, Windsor and he provided boarding to people and he provided boarding to her mother who so that she could attend the Windsor Collegiate through the week and she would go home to Maidstone on the weekends. And there's immigration and naturalization records. I'm going to speed it up a little bit because uh, I'm running short on time here. Um, so this is a naturalization record for my great grandfather um, prior to the Canadian Citizenship Act of 1947, there was no such thing as a Canadian citizen. People who were born in Canada were just British subjects, but those from non-Commonwealth countries were considered aliens and had to become naturalized, like my great-grandfather William Coughlin, who was born in Poughkeepsie, New York. Also, other uncommon records are court records and asylum records, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And other uncommon records are genealogy websites and Google. I can attest to the fact that genealogy websites are a great way to find information about lost female ancestors. So now that we've looked at the five common records and the five strategies and some helpful uncommon records, I'll give you five very brief examples and I might have to race through them uh, so that we can get to the end on time. Um, but Cindy, I'll give you, Cindy, yes, it's Cindy. Don't, um, I was going to let you know, don't rush too much. Um, we can probably go an extra, you know, 10, 15 minutes over because we started late. So go ahead, okay. and, go ahead and take your time. There's so much great stuff you have to offer. I'm actually thinking I'm going to talk super fast and nobody's <laughs> going to understand anything I'm saying. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Take your time. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that, Cindy. Um, so now I'm going to talk about five brief examples of my female ancestors in my tree and some of the records that I that were very helpful for me to find them. I'm going to start with my great aunt Nellie Moynihan, who was born in 1865 in Essex and died in 1940. I grew up hearing stories uh, about my grandfather and his eldest sister Nellie. She, was, she played such a critical role in the Moynihan family. And the thing is that Nellie never married. 
And so the stories that get passed down to us are sort of oral traditions, but I always wanted to know more about her. And I started digging through newspapers and I found out that she, she traveled to teach at her schools by horse and buggy and she was thrown off in 1892 and that she often bicycled to her schools and she fell off her bike even in 1904 and that she cared for her parents till their final days and was tireless in all of her activities and devoted to her large extended family, dearly loved by my grandparents. She was so much more than a teacher and so I turned to oral histories and then I started searching even deeper and I found letters that she had written to members of the family where she talks about what her day was like and how she was feeling. And I also found newspaper clippings where in this particular one, I read that Miss Nellie Moynihan will talk to the ladies of the Old Castle Women's Institute about her trip through Ireland and Scotland. Everybody was welcomed. I also relied on local histories. This beautiful piece here uh, came to me through a historical society, the Old Sandwich South and Area Historical Society, where I read for the first time that Nellie actually started teaching when she was only 15 years old. And the photo of her sitting here with her sister, uh, Ann Jobin, is one that I've never ever seen before. So this came from a local hist historical society and the records that they are now making available to people online. And this piece comes from someone who decided to speak about his experience having been educated uh, by Nelly in the classroom. And he talked about how the boys would try to mischievously try to undermine her, but how they could never really get one past her. And then he goes on to say, Thomas P. McCloskey said, the only slap I got all the time I went to school was from her. That was shortly after I started. I feel so bad for little Tom. Something was done in the school and she could not pick out the guilty ones, so she gave us all a slap. <laughs> I, so these are stories that you would never hear. And here is a beautiful picture of Nellie, uh, pictured in the far left seated. And this was her 1908 trip. She's on deck with all of the women that she traveled with, having a hearty laugh. And I like to think that, um, you know, she had a grand old time. This was her retirement gift to herself. Nellie was also a surrogate mother, and here she is pictured uh, as acting as the uh, sponsor for Veronica Rosette, Rosette who was uh, getting her, I think, first communion in this picture. So researching our unmarried ancestors can reveal such interesting and full lives and stories that deserve to be told. I am always inspired by stories about Nellie. The next uh, case study that I want to show you is about Jemima Agnes Hind, who was the daughter of my great grandmother, Agnes Bell Hind, who died in 1888. She had three daughters and a son. And for some reason, and this was in Glasgow, and for some reason, her two daughters and son were sent to the Glasgow workhouse. But her third daughter, Jemima disappeared completely from the records. I asked if anybody knew what had happened for her, if anybody had found a death record for her. No one knew exactly what had happened to her. And then one day I was entering her name into a search engine and it appeared on a passenger list. In 1889, she landed in the port of Montreal. And what's curious is she's on a ship that's filled with children. So notice that all the other passengers on the ship are young girls and they're all 12 and 13 years old. And then I looked in the margins and it said that it was Corrier children. So I came to learn that the Corrier children uh, were part of the British home child movement and that Jemima had actually been put on a ship and sent to Canada uh, to become help 
uh, for farmers and whatnot. But the interesting thing is that I found Jemima on the 1891 census in Montreal working as a servant for a family there. And then I found her on the 1901 census working in Brockville at this house that you see pictured here, which is known as the Ferknow House, which was the Quarier receiving home. So the children would be sent from the United Kingdom and they would land, they'd be brought to Brockville and then from Brockville, they would be dispersed to farms all over Ontario. I got curious about why Jemima got sent and I wanted to know more. So I actually rode away to the Quarier's and they sent me her file. I had hoped that it would have a picture of her uh, but it did not, but it certainly told me the story of her arriving in Glasgow and being sent uh, over. And the reason why I wanted to add Jemima's story here is because if you have a female ancestor who suddenly appears in a certain time period and no one ever spoke or ever knew or ever asked or was ever told where they came from, I would suggest that there is a remote possibility that this ancestor may be a British home child. A hundred thousand children were sent over to Ontario and few of them ever talked about it with their families once they began their own families. And um, so you might wanna check that resource. And I have put uh, links in your handout to a search engine where you can go where the names of the children are provided. I want to talk next about infirm women. I told you earlier that on the census record for 1871, I have my third great grandmother, Catherine, circled below, who's 58 years old, born in Ireland. And when I looked at the column on the census, there is a column at the very end of the census that says infirmities. And one of the columns, so the columns are uh, deaf and blind, and then of unsound mind. And it was circled unsound mind. So I searched uh, the records, 1881 records, I could find her nowhere. And then all of a sudden I went on to a website called ontariogenealogy.com. And there was a record for the Malden Asylum. And there she was. And I wrote away for the, uh, record and here's the details of her arrival at the Malden Asylum and here's the, a picture of the Malden Insane Asylum and there she is circled Moynihan Catherine along with uh, many of the other inmates. Well the problem is that this asylum was closed in 1870 so there was confusion about how could Catherine be there and what happened to all the people who were inmates there? And I came to learn that they were all transferred to the London Psychiatric Hospital. <clears throat> so I, I, I went to the Ontario Archives, which has all kinds of asylum records. And uh, I pulled her complete file to find out what happened. She ended up eventually dying in 1872, tragically, and I still have not found her final resting place. Um, I wanna also tell you the story about that lovely Sarah who had the lovely hat in the picture. And I had told you that her mother and father had died after the taking of the 1911 census and that I had no idea where she was. Uh, her funeral card, which I had been given for my grandmother's belongings, said she died in 1945, but where did she go? So I wrote to the Ontario Registrar and I applied to get her death certificate and I learned that when she did die in 1945, she had died at the House of Providence in London, Ontario. So then I wrote to the Sisters of St. Joseph's. They have a wonderful archive and there's a wonderful archivist that uh, works there. She's still there. And uh, she sent me a package uh, showing Daisy and the many other people who were living there at the time. And here's a picture of Daisy taken in 1940. She looks so lovely and happy. Um, she's being visited there by her brother and his family. I mentioned Daisy's story because it could be that if you had a, a female ancestor who was ill or infirm, that you may have to look towards London, Ontario records to locate her. 
This next story is an interesting one because this is again is a, a reason for us to be very grateful for historical societies. This is a case study about a distant cousin who was estranged. So when you have a change in marital status, things become very difficult. And he is a distant cousin who was estranged and separated from his wife and eventually moved to Colorado. The problem is that he died in Colorado, as did his three sons listed on there. And you can see the two circles that I've made on the, on the image. Those two women, I could find them nowhere. So that's the mother, Frances E. Hiles, and Louise M. Minahan. The South Park National Heritage Area actually wrote me an email and they said I was researching another Moynihan in the area and they said well given that you're researching that Moynihan you'll certainly be interested in Captain James Minahan because he was a cousin to the man that you're looking that I was actively researching at the time. So they sent me all kinds of information, the headstones, they sent me obituaries, and slowly but surely, what happened to the two women um, started to appear. And then I found this. I found a note about a couple, a Miss Minahan and a gentleman who apparently eloped in Chicago. So there's no way that I would have been looking in Chicago for a marriage record uh, for Louise Minahan, um, but here was the newspaper article in the Detroit Press. So this record helped me sort of now unpack a whole bunch of information and eventually it led me to this passport application and there she is down below. Uh, there's Louise, found at last. She went on, she married, she had children, and she had a very good life. Uh, the same can't be said for the, her mother, who um, became a, rec a recluse, and she, uh, she actually passed away tragically in New York City. And here is uh, the person who was the Historical Society had sent me his tombstone, and here's his daughter, and I can't help but say there is a striking resemblance between the two. Now, my last case study is to talk about uh, relocated women, and the reason why I put this in here is Hannah Moynihan married a Warnock, and in the early 1900s, when there were lots of incentives for people to go west, because they were hoping there was offers of property and whatnot, that it's a really good place uh, to look if this is the time period where you lose your women and, and your female ancestor and she was married, it would be worth your while to look at the homestead records of Alberta and the West. Um, Hannah's story actually begins with one of the five common record sources where we always start looking for the women. And I found her marriage to Bill Warnock on, in 1896 in Essex County. And then Hannah was in the newspapers and it was saying that she had moved to Wisconsin and then later to Alberta. And now we come to the part where, so here we have a find a grave listing. This was the sort of thing that broke open from this find a grave record, you can see, that not only can I see the children, I can see their, their birth dates and everything. So all of that to say that find a grave is sometimes worth exploring uh, because often people put extra information in there that can really help you unlock details about your female ancestors in a way that you wouldn't normally uh, be able to do. So those were the five case studies. And now I wanna talk about some special Ex Essex County resources that I absolutely love and that I want you to consider when you're trying to find your female ancestors. And the first one is education. And so the Essex newspapers always carry stories about the students and the students being promoted from one grade to the other. And um, 
Here you can see is a picture of my great grandfather, John Monahan, who taught in Essex County in SS4. And here's a picture of the school with him with all of his students in 1900. And the names of every student is listed. So sometimes you could be lucky enough to find the names of your female ancestors uh, in a school photo such as this. But also, I have to say, I was exploring the Essex branch, the offerings they have on their members only section, and I was completely uh, gobsmacked at how much, how many school records they have. So they have, uh, they are currently undertaking a high school yearbook scanning project. And this little screenshot here is but a small sample of the schools in which they are starting to upload information about. Um, so I highly recommend that you explore uh, the members only section of the Essex branch uh, records. There's incredible things to be found there. Uh, fun stuff like this too. So this was one of the pictures I looked at the St. Mary's yearbook and there's this lovely picture. I just couldn't help but put it in here. It made me smile. The, the nun apparently saying, what do you mean you can't find Maidstone? I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> um, the next thing I want you to think about is that um, Prior to marrying, there's a good chance that your an female ancestor may have had employment somewhere. And I want to talk about one case in particular, and that is my grandmother, Rhea Coughlin, pictured here on her border crossing card. So border crossing cards were issued for people who had to cross back and forth from Windsor to Detroit. And so this particular border crossing card is dated 1927, which was before she was married. And when I looked on the back, it said the reason why she had to commute, and she started in uh, 1919, was so that she could go work at Park Davis in Detroit. So this was a treasure trove. Like I actually couldn't imagine my grandmother working, but prior to marrying, she in fact did work at Park Davis, as did all these women pictured behind. This is a, and you can't see all of them, but these are a lot of the women who worked at Park Davis at the same time. Um, and here's a picture of Park Davis as it would have appeared back in those days. Um, the other thing is nurses. So I provided a lot of resources for nurses. In this particular example, um, my great aunt Agnes Broderick, she became a nurse and I've created a lot of background um, history on her based on uh, books that are available, readily available about the nurses in the Windsor area. And I have also provided links for those in your handout. I also want you to think about women have roles within their family and women have roles outside their family. And I know that there's, um, for example, my great grandmother, uh, Brennan, she was considered to be a midwife in the community, um, but also uh, um, other ancestors had other roles. So some of them were like within their church, they were leaders within their church, they were scout leaders, they had membership in women's organizations. And I want to make special mention of the role that Myrtle Crowder played. Um, she's pictured on the top right hand corner, buried under a bunch of papers. Myrtle was elected the curator of the newly formed Old Castle Women's Institute and contributed to the Tweedsmuir history, which is an incredible resource, particularly for our female ancestors. And I feel like it's one that deserves special mention here. Um, in fact, the Old Sandwich uh, Historical Society actually credits Myrtle on their website and says that the majority of the information found in the documents that detail the history were much, were thanks to Myrtle. Um, so thank you, Myrtle, for all of that work. And finally, I recommend that um, people go offline because not everything is online. Um, the legacy of Myrtle, who actually uh, gathered all of her stories directly from residents. She went into the community. She asked questions. She compiled records on paper that we can now read today. But she's a reminder that we too, 
need to visit these communities, visit the Essex museums, the Essex libraries, the historical societies. This particular picture here was taken at the Sandwich South Cultural and Resource Centre. And the table and chairs that you see there were table and chairs that my great grandfather John Monaghan sat in when the first Sandwich South Council was established in 1893. What a resource to have in the community. And the people that work in these uh, small uh, museums and libraries and historical societies, they're just like a, a gold mine of information. So, so the, the point is you need to go offline too. Not everything that you're gonna find can, not everything that you need to know about your female ancestor can be found online. I encourage people to go offline, of course, when it's safe and we're still, and we're still not under COVID. Um, I also think it's important to talk to family members. So I've already shown you an example how an oral history has just yielded so much information for me. And in your handout, I've given you some scripts for oral histories. So if you have folks you know now, go talk to them, uh, call them, do a Zoom call with them. And then the last resource that I'm going to talk about, this is the second last slide, um, is that right now uh, many, including me, are turning to uh, DNA. And uh, it's a great thing. It's, uh, it's, it's not a sure, sure way of finding your female ancestors, but I have located many maternal distant cousins. And I have also connected joyfully with adoptees in my own family tree. So I encourage you to consider that um, as a possibility in searching for your female ancestors. So um, my final slide is a picture of me. That's chubby little me on the left on Campbell Avenue with my cousin Lori and my great grandmother, Mary Broderick Moynihan who was born, born in Essex County in 1869, and she died in 1960, shortly after this photo was taken. I treasure this photo, and I continue to search for stories about her. What it means to be a woman changes from generation to generation, from culture to culture, and from society to society. And although women as a group share the experience of gender, they are divided by the equally significant experiences of race, ethnicity, class, and sexuality. Let's collect all of those stories. Let's hear all those voices. I hope that you've been inspired to collect some of your stories of your female ancestors and good luck. <laughs> That's it. I don't know how far I went over, Cindy, but I apologize. No, actually, that was fantastic. Cindy. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. You brought up so many points, you know, unmarried women and the important role that they played, not just in their family, but in society as a whole. And yes. your point about, you know, Essex County is neighbors with the states, with Michigan. So that was a good tip to look at the border records and the crossings. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just to remember to look across that border and, you know, investigate what was happening at the time your female ancestor was living on this side of the border because things over there might have drew her across the border. Um, and maybe that's the direction you need to look. Right. Right. In your handouts, thank you so much. They are fantastic. Um, I can't say we've ever had any handouts that are so comprehensive and complete. Oh, so you. I think everybody will appreciate all the hard work that Cindy put into those. And I just want to say thank you so very much. So I'm not sure if there's any questions or not. Um, Kim, did any come in or Pat's here to help and um, uh, Tammy's here to help ask questions too. Uh, there's been a bunch of thank yous and fantastic presentations oh, that have been coming in. Um, actually, I just sent a question to Pat if okay. she wants to. Is my mic on? Yes, I hear you, Pat. Okay. From Judy, she says, do you have a compiled history of the Moynihan family for the Old Sandwich South Historical Center? So I, I'm not sure if she's looking at a donation or... I actually, so I have everything in small pieces, but I do think that one of the things that I need to do is to put everything into one solid package. That would be great. Yeah. 
Another COVID project for you. Another COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that brings up another good point of, you know, don't forget to share your, your family history. Once you find the information of these yes. female ancestors, make sure you share that with your local groups because, you know, other people will be looking and also for preservation purposes. So all that hard work that you did, you want to make sure that it's preserved and it's shared for the next generation. And I should add too that I maintain a blog. So I, I run a blog called Moynihan Genealogy Blogspot. And I've, I've been operating that blog since 2015 and trying to write brief stories. And I, I have to say that even as recently as two days ago, I received a comment on one of my blog posts and I wish I had it in front of me and I could read it to you, but someone said, that's my grandmother. And I never knew that story, that part about her. Thank you so much for doing that. And um, I do find that people will find you if you put your story online. So it's a great way also to expand on what you already know by including, you know, farther branches of the tree. Right. So Judy says we are collecting family history. So I take it that means the old sandwich. So yes, Rico Center. So that would be wonderful. Okay. Yeah. But I've gotten lots of good comments. Such a clear presentation. Cindy spoke slowly, clearly, and enunciated so well. Thanks so much. <laughs> I um, thought I was. I thought I was really rushing it. I was mindful of the time and the fact that I had a technical glitch that delayed our start. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Cindy, from Deborah. Lots of good areas to research. Um, from Linda, great handouts. Thank you very, thank you very helpful information. Um, that's great information. Thank you from Vancouver, BC. Oh wow, lovely, Jerry. And that was a fabulous presentation from Linda. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. In the main chat, there's um, a, a, um, a message from Susan, and she said, it was great hearing the Tweeds and Mirror pages noted. I have oh. found some great things about my mother in there, mostly oh. under Mrs. Freddie Wil Wilman. Yes, yes. Wow. And I, I can tell you, so, and I have to really, I have to say it again, um, but that I found that going through the members only section on the... Essex Branch uh, website was just extraordinary. Like I, I found it was just incredible. And I, I have tried to put links to a bunch of um, uh, sites that I have found incredibly helpful, incredibly helpful. So hopefully people who are curious about the tweets more, I think you'll find some good links there that you can follow through in the handout. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, if there's no more questions, um, we'll let everybody um, get on with their evening. Uh, and once again, Cindy, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Well, thank um, you. I truly appreciate it. And uh, perhaps we will have you back again because you have so much information um, and maybe on another topic. So that would, I think that would be a wonderful idea. Well, thank you very much. And again, I want to thank the volunteers at the Essex branch. I mean, I have benefited uh, from the ongoing work there and it's, um, it's extraordinary to see what's going on right now presently. So thank you, the volunteers past and present for all that you do. That's great. Thank you so much. And you have another yeah. thank you from Dallas, Texas. And Wow. Thank you. <laughs> this is wonderful. But okay. Well, thank you, everybody. We will sign off for tonight and take care and uh, have a good month. See you Thanks later. so much. Take care. Thank you.